Arrested Development. No. 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 Never heard of it. I've heard of it, but I really don't know anything about it. Tell me about it. What is it? It's a TV show. Yeah. What is it? I think I watched it a couple times. Who's in it? Was it on HBO or something like that? I understand it was a pretty good show. But they canceled it. Yeah. I'm seriously sitting here being interviewed on a show because I love it so much. I don't remember ever laughing as hard at anything on television. It's just the funniest show I've ever seen, ever. It's my favorite show ever, ever. Arrested Development across all borders is hilarious. Yeah, if you're watching an episode and it doesn't seem funny, then it, you know it's something wrong with you. It's getting to laugh at rich people for being stupid. <laughs> it's brilliant. Revolutionary. People were not ready for the show at all. You have to be forewarned for this kind of brilliance. True story. Um, Neil, Jeff. I created a show called Arrested Development, of which there are more um, fans in this movie than there are outside of this movie. I'm Joe Russo, my brother Anthony. We directed the uh, pilot. You know, the show came about at a unique time in um, television history. You know, I, I worked a long time in situation comedy, and sitcoms had become stuck. And it was sort of born in the wake of the rise of HBO and HBO's reinvention of, of what television is. I did a show called Everything's Relative, which was in many ways a precursor to Arrested Development. And it was about a family that was completely enmeshed with itself and obsessed with itself. And we did four episodes, and it was trashed by critics, and, uh, and it died. But it, it, it started to play with the form that I had come up in having worked on the Golden Girls and things like that. A guy named David Nevins was at NBC when we did it. I'm David Nevins, I'm the president of Imagine Television. So when he became president at Imagine Television, his boss, Ron Howard, told him he wanted to do a show that was kind of multimedia. And it would have this sort of fast-paced, loose, home movie slash documentary style. It was a very unformed idea at that point. Nevins called us and we started throwing around ideas. And he said, come in, I want to talk to you guys. There's this show that we're working on, this idea that Ron had. I had this notion that it should look and, and feel and sound different than you know, what you were traditionally seeing in half-hour television comedy. They had said that Ron wanted to sort of reinvent the half-hour. And we had this idea that we wanted to feel very guerrilla. And that was one of the reasons why we chose the Russos, because they hadn't done a ton of network comedies. They were young, and they certainly felt like they were going to be in tune with that guerrilla filmmaking. They could get a lot done very, very quickly when they needed to. We had shot our first credit card movie for $35,000, so we really knew sort of guerrilla filmmaking tactics. Right from the beginning, that was how we wanted to do it. And part of the reason we hired them is because we knew that they would be comfortable with that. And then I, I met with a few writers, and one of them was Mitch Hurwitz. I'd worked with before on Everything's Relative, and I always had a feeling about Mitch. And Mitch really, really liked the idea. He'd kind of come up through traditional sitcoms, but I always felt that he was probably the best bet to be the next great comedy voice. And he had this, started talking about, in a second meeting, this family of his. We uh, started thinking, well, maybe it, it should be about a family. He wanted to do a highly dysfunctional extended family, with extreme characters. And David Nevin suggested maybe there's some element that, that pushes them together. My brother and sister-in-law moved in with me, so we talked about sort of adult siblings coming together. And I thought that was pretty great. That was around the time of Enron and all these accounting frauds. And I actually worried at the time, like, well, will this be out of date by the time we get on the air? <laughs> you know, will there be no more accounting fraud? 
And I even said, maybe you could even have a narrator if you want. Ron instantly said, I, I like that guy, Mitch, and uh, we're off and running. Writing the pilot was the biggest challenge I'd ever had up until that point. Mitch came back with this script, and the story was, it was just so funny, and it was so unusual. I kind of wanted to do a show about a family that, because of their, their wealth, they hadn't developed as human beings. What Mitch loves to write is just people being so wrong-headed and yet so believing that they're right. I'm always fascinated when I sort of go back and look at the pilot of the density of the storytelling in it. I don't really know how, how close the Bluths are to his family, but you, know, you listen to him talk about it, and it seems like they're not too far off. And he grafted onto his childhood in Orange County. There are characters that are represented from my real life in there. I knew his family story, and a lot of that had been in Everything's Relative. I was from a family that was somewhat overprotective. I did have a cousin. She did go to schools that didn't have grades and, you know, gave out crocodiles and things like that. And Mitch sold. I don't know if he told you this. My brother and I had started a cookie business when we were kids called The Chip Yard. Down at the, at the pier in Orange County. And there's actually one in Boston still. And that kind of became the banana stand. You know, Mitch just has, once he gets going on something, he has a very, like, fertile mind. Things started crackling, and it came together very quickly. I ended up doing 30 drafts of the pilot. The great thing about the long script was that it really allowed us to understand what Mitch was thinking. Every character had three things, and I think that that's one of the things that is so appealing about the show. So anyway, I had this script that's 70 pages in its tightest, tightest form. There were all of these backstories for everybody. The fun of the show and, and the charm of the show really came about in that initial development phase and trying to condense that down to 30-some pages. I first came across the script when my, uh, my good friend Mitch Hurwitz sent it to me. I thought it was an insanely crazy, funny script, and I thought that they would never make it in a million years. And turned it in, and then the network like picked it up that afternoon. that it was different by, obviously, the cast that was assembled. There's never been a cast that was better, sharper, funnier. Casting, more than anything, really defines a television show. All of it, all of it came out of Mitch Hurwitz. Great TV writers like Mitch really adapt to who they end up with as the actors for their show. It's hard to cast, you know, three out of five parts right. But, you know, he got nine for nine. This is a nice place you guys live in the back. What's the first word that comes to your mind? Bateman is a fucking god. That's a sentence. That's not a word. Today, you're going to be talking to Jason Bateman, who played Michael Bluth. I love Michael. 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 He's a single dad who's lost his wife. Jason Bateman. Who knew this guy was that funny? Michael Bluth is sort of the glue that holds the show together. He was the least eccentric of the family, probably the most appropriate to sort of channel the show through. Which was the hardest thing to find for the show, is the center of the show. Camera friendly, uh, network friendly, but could deliver a, a badass joke. I remember seeing Jason Bateman's name on the casting sheet. But there was a concern on the part of the network and studio because he had been in a series of pilots that hadn't made it to the air. I don't know how many people they went through before they landed on me, but uh, I don't need to hear it. I don't, I don't want to know what you know. So their feeling was that he had this um, baggage of unsuccessful shows in his recent history. Didn't really know that much about him. But I knew that he did a lot of pilots every year. And I was going to be auditioning for another show that Mitch Hurwitz was also producing the following day, something that looks like it was definitely going to go on the air and that I'd be more sort of suited for. So I went in and I auditioned for it. And he killed it. We're like, F we've got our guy. We've got Michael Booth. And Mitch follows me out of the reading room. And I remember running out into the hallway and saying, this, right? Would you, you like this, right? Don't come in tomorrow for that other thing. I said, great. I, that's my ride. I gotta go. Hey, don't mind that. You're How do I not mind that? I think I had the most, you know, serious laughs. You know, where I almost hurt myself with Job. 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 George Oscar Bluth. 
I play Will Arnett. My name is Joe Bluth. Job stands for uh, George Oscar Bluth. And everyone always calling him Gob. Gob. Couldn't cast Job. We needed that kind of macho end of the spectrum to balance off Tony Hale on the other end and put Michael in the middle. I was an actor, I was living in New York, and they were looking for the part of Job. I was looking for a job. <laughs> it was perfect. I almost believe like that's who Will Arnett is. It's just too true a performance. Will Arnett as Job took that role to a level I don't think anybody knew it was going to go to. You know, it was such a specifically written thing, and I thought that would make it easier for actors. I'd done a pilot for CBS. It went to series. And in that, between that time, my character was written off the show. I remember my manager calling me and saying, you gotta read this, you gotta read this. And I said, I'm not gonna do it. TV already broke my heart, you know? And uh, I'm not gonna go down the aisle again with lady television. And he said, I don't know what the f you're talking about. This is very professional. Oh my God. Lindsay is my favorite character. Lindsay Bluth. Lindsay! I'm Portia de Rossi, and I played Lindsay Bluth Fionke. Lindsay is um, the daughter of the family, and kind of a vapid twit. Portia's part was written the opposite, in a way, of what Portia played. She was very um, self-obsessed. She wears, like, ostrich skin boots, yet somehow she pretends that she wants to save the trees and help the environment not terribly caring about anyone in her family or anyone around her. Then she is only focused on what's going to get her son loving, basically. And she was the actress that was funny enough and special enough that made me change the writing, which I hadn't done with the other parts. Very underrated. Portia Rossi, like, rocks my socks off. Professional here. Oh, crap. I really think my favorite character is Buster. 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 Byron Buster Bluth. Buster is the youngest brother of all the siblings to uh, Michael and Job and Lindsay. And uh, he is just an anxiety-ridden mama's boy. And no one else is really bothered to spend the time to break him out of it. Our delightful Tony Hale. I think one of the best descriptions of Buster was, he was in the womb for 11 months. He really is like the medical definition of arrested development. Tape came in from New York. And I remember walking into casting one day, and Mitch was just like, so excited. He's like, you, got, you guys got to watch this. You got to watch this casting tape. Mitch was saying once that I did something with my knees, but the shot was only from here down, so they didn't know what I was doing. The video just started with him kind of rocking. And in fact, what he was doing was he was he was doing this massage that was in the script, but his hands were out of frame. So all I saw was this. Hey, brother. Very professional. <laughs> Very professional. <laughs> I'm Jeffrey Tambor, and I've got to play two roles. I got to play George Senior, and I got to play his his errant brother Oscar. You know, Jeffrey Tambor wasn't originally supposed to be on the show. You know, Mitch had a previous working relationship with Tambor. We were shooting the pilot, and I had this part of George Sr. I think I was doing Hellboy 1. I had a month off, so I came back to the United States. And literally, as I hit the airport, I was rechecking my messages, and there was a message from Mitch. I called Jeffrey really the night before. Would you come on for a day and play the father? Would you come down and do this thing tomorrow? And I never thought of another thing about it. And then I got a phone call. And then, fortunately, he said to me, I could actually see doing this on a weekly basis. I'm like, oh, thank God. George Sr., Bernie Madoff with heart. <laughs> Somebody like Jeffrey Tambor, when he's on board, you just know it's going to be a very real sort of comedy. I always wonder how you follow up a role as iconic as what he played on Larry Sanders, and to turn around and get another show where you have that great a role again. I think Tambor was blessed. He really set the comedic tone for the show. Lucille is my favorite character. Gangy. She's a raging bitch. She's a drunk. Not a good mother. Doesn't really care much what happens to the family as long as she still comes out on top at the end. Oh, she's just evil. <laughs> That's why she's great. We were having a hard time casting the mother, and there was somebody I really wanted that the network wouldn't approve. 
And Sandy Grusha said to me, Mitch, this is how pilots fall apart. We don't have a mother. And Deb Borelsky, once again, the casting director, said, let's bring in Jessica Walter. And she was exactly what you see. I mean, she's just crisp and tight and hilarious and mean. And Sandy Grusha said, OK, she could play the mother, like that. My grandmother was exactly like Lucille, just a gold digging evil person. God rest her soul. I don't even know how you describe a character like Tobias. I don't think anyone else could be Tobias Funke. You can never go wrong with David Cross, ever. People know who you are, but tell us anyway. Why? Seems like a waste of time. People already know who I am. I love David Cross. Called him and said, any part you want to play. I was first talking to Mitch about it before I had even met Mitch, talking on the phone. And I was hoping he wouldn't say Michael Bluth. And I remember thinking, there's no f***ing way that David Cross is going to do a network television show. He thought about it, and he got back to me and said, uh, I think I'd like to play Tobias. Tobias is a little bit of all of us. He does get the greatest lines, but at the same time, he's the one who carries probably the longest running joke. I've met a lot of Tobiases in my life. Out of all the characters, he probably makes me laugh the most. You see a lot of them in Boston. He lays around the house all day, and he says funny lines all day long. I mean, that's my idol. Some people might disagree, but I think he's a real loser. There's something so blank slate about George Michael. George Michael is Michael Bluth's son. His mother has passed away, and he is just the struggling conscious of the whole family. He embraces the fact that his family's kind of messed up. But he's so soft-spoken and good-natured that he can't force his conscience on anybody else. George Michael is the most lovable one of the Bluths. I mean, he's the only one that really does no wrong. And I think they need that one character. Michael Sarah, I had seen in a pilot that he'd done years before. It was like the embodiment of sort of Woody Allen and a 12-year-old kid. You know, I don't know where they found Michael Sarah. We found out he's in Brampton or something, Canada. The casting director calls me and says, great news, Michael Sarah liked the script and he's willing to read for this. And I was like, he liked this, he's 14. Like, he's discriminating? My name's Alia Shokat. I played maybe a few K on Arrested Development. <laughs> Alia, I cast off a photograph. I was actually casting another pilot at the time. We were looking for a kid, and I came across this picture of Alia, and I put it in this other pilot. I just liked her little quirky look and her bright eyes. Maybe the teenage daughter of Tobias and Lindsay. She doesn't look like either of them, so question marks are everywhere. She's like a rebellious teenager who's street smart, just not book smart. She's just got that confidence through the roof, and nothing's going to stop her. I think the narrator's like my favorite character. I wound up being the narrator, but that was kind of an accident. And then I got kind of corralled into it, but I was really glad that I, that I was. His voice is so pleasant to listen to. He's an unbelievably creative guy and a very ambitious guy. Here's this, like, unbelievably accredited director who's narrating this show. But he's not the narrator. It's Ron Howard talking about his show. Ron is like my younger brother. He was in favor of all the rules that we broke. With Arrested Development, you could have the narrator exposing the hypocrisy of the characters or creating little jokes by making little observations. He kind of almost says what you're thinking. Whenever he talks, you see his face. I never saw him. You know, he was a voiceover. In doing the narration, often I was doing it from, you know, like inside the cab of the sound man's truck in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It really not only carried the plot line forward, but added another laugh, you know, into the mix. We've been huge fans of Arrested Development since the series premiered. On the very first episode. Oh, I got hooked. Pretty much got hooked. I was hooked, hooked. Episode one. We couldn't stop watching it. And I had this really cool teacher in high school. So I went up and I was chatting with him before class, and I saw this strange little white and orange box. And I was like, what's this? And it's like, that is the greatest show you'll ever watch. I'm one of those people that had a friend. Wouldn't leave me alone about it. <laughs> 
No, no, man, just watch the pilot, man. It's gonna be so cool. You're gonna totally get into this. My friends that would watch it would quote it to each other all the time throughout the day. I just made him buy the DVDs. Yes, he didn't even know if he'd like it. And I wanted to be a part of that. And then I heard people talking about it. Everyone was talking about it. So we ended up watching five episodes that night. A few episodes turned into like eight hour marathon. And by then I was completely hooked. And just fell in love from there. Instantly. And that was it. You want me to explain the plot of Arrested Development? No, it's not possible to give a rundown of the plot. You can encapsulate it in, in a book the size of a dictionary. At its heart, Arrested Development is a show about family dynamics. And it's a show about an adult family and how damaged they are. That's not really what it's about, though, is it? Basically, it's, it's, it's about a, a, you know, a family with a hell of a lot of baggage that has had money and acts as though they still do. And yet one of the sons, he's sort of the, the only one that sees the reality of their situation. These are rich, snobby bastards, but they're so fucked up. Their family is probably a lot closer to the average American family than, you know, any of these other crap comedies that are on television. It's a show about family values. But in a sick, twisted, dysfunctional way. Family first. Family first. Here we have the family that at one point had everything except ethics and scruples. It's just about a family that lost their money and became desperate and needed to bond together to, to make it through this economic storm. And we, the audience and the cameras, follow them as they try to you know, navigate the, the challenges of the less privileged. That's a very unfunny way to say it. I think everything starts and ends with the writing. It was the best writing staff I've ever seen put together. They worked hard. They really, really, really worked hard. It was a constant reinforcing of, wow, these guys are good. There's so much going on. I mean, there's so much bang for your buck. Every few seconds, there's a joke, a setup, a joke, a setup. Most of the time on network television, you write to the lowest common denominator. You want to please the masses. Arrested Development never did that. It didn't care if you got the joke or not. We did the show more or less as Mitch wrote it and had a lot of faith in our audience to get the jokes. There wasn't a lot of room for just rambling. It wasn't that laugh out loud. And then once you got it, it was belly laughs. It was so quick, so quick. It was almost like an airplane moving. While you're laughing, you're missing three jokes. We did do more complicated shows, more complicated stories, so they would be more rewatchable. You know, I just wanted every single thing to be funny. He is a perfectionist. He would just give you these just brilliant, you know, lines to say, and it was a joy. It was just joy to be able to say them. Truly, every time I'd get a script, I would get up early those mornings and read it. We used to call each other and say, oh my god, have you read this week's script? It's so funny. I've never done that before, and I haven't done it since. They were dedicated to making the best possible comedy on the air. Usually, over the course of like a series, for five years, you'd be lucky to get one script that good. We were getting it on a weekly basis. I remember people telling me, like, that's not normal. I really wanted every character to have a story. I wanted the stories to be intertwined. Um, and I don't completely know why. You know, it wasn't just like, what's the King of Queens doing this week in episode 403? You know, it's it, the characters don't really change in those shows. And this, you could see immediately the characters were going to grow and develop. I just felt like that was the challenge of this particular series. I don't know that I would have done that on another show. It's one of those shows that rewards you for paying attention. Who thinks three years ahead in the arc of their comedy? Well, Mitch does, and very few other writers can. I loved the kinds of shows that you could watch and look for detail and try to put the pieces together yourself. I loved being a little bit behind. There were few times on screen when there weren't multiple levels of comedy going on. You really have to think and be paying attention to get it. You really had the you know, focus. Because there's a hidden gem in every episode. Every time I watch the show, I pick up something new. 
there are so many jokes on a joke on a joke on a joke on a joke. And they don't care. If you can't keep up, you have to watch it again. And all the pieces fit together. There's not a point where it just doesn't make sense or it's out of sync. They all kind of fall into place. The running jokes just were used in so many different contexts that they really didn't have a chance to get old. Some of them are so far ahead, like you're like, okay, where's that going? And when he gets there, it's such like a payoff. To write a sitcom and put in jokes that you're gonna pay off four episodes later, that's really, you gotta really have stones to do that. Sitcoms traditionally work in a fairly methodical way. Television is typically sort of a less focused format as far as an audience goes. You know, you can be a little distracted. You can be checking to see if your kid's done the homework or, you know, you can pay bills. And for the most part, you could not do that with Arrested Development. It really required your full attention. That is not the average way that people watch television. It was hell to make because each one's kind of like a movie. I knew it was it was completely different than anything that, that we'd really seen on American television. We wanted to feel like the Osbournes, like a reality show, a camera guy and a sound guy walking around following people, and we didn't want it to feel very produced. Basically, it was a handheld show. Sort of low production value, simple cameras. We were shooting fast and furious, especially first, uh, no lighting to speak of. We were just shooting off the hip. Mitch didn't like to limit the show by having to shoot all of it in the house. So every episode, we were out in a car driving around. But it drew you in, too. It's like you were actually following these guys. There was a style to shooting it that was supposed to be very real. In fact, I think that was sort of the motto of the first year, you come to shoot, and no, no, no horse We even put on the breakdown that goes out to actors, agents, when actors are auditioning. This is how we're gonna make it, so you better be comfortable with it. You're not gonna have a giant trailer. You know, we'll try to have decent hair and makeup so you don't look like shit. But other than that, you gotta be in tune with the kind of very loose filmmaking style. They would say, do it, do a chicken dance, and you would have to do your chicken dance. You know, bark, 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 bark. I mean, you know, and everybody, I think Will, Will's chicken dance was the best. I was always encouraging everybody to shoot with two cameras. We come up with all these rules for the cameras and how the cameras were to act and, and uh, have their own personality. And so we wanted to kind of capitalize on that and sort of play to the idea that we were sort of flies on the wall watching this family's travails unfold. You could buy yourself a lot of time to experiment. Actors could improvise. Comedy writers could rewrite. We'd send operators onto the set without seeing a rehearsal, and they didn't end up banging into each other, and but they would get the most amazing stuff. We were able to move very quickly in keeping with the whole pseudo uh, documentary style. And I remember Joe Russo turning to me one time and saying, Jimmy, can you believe they're letting us do this shit? I knew that we were following the beat of our own drummer and that it was going to feel very different than every other show. And I, I secretly, I was always wishing I could direct an episode, uh, but I never, had a, I never had a chance to. Nowadays in television, it's not surprising because a lot of shows look like this now. But at the time, for a scripted show, it was unconventional to look as bad as Arrested Development looked. Franklin, do you remember Franklin. what he sings? It ain't easy being white. It ain't easy being white. Franklin is one of the greatest characters on the show. It ain't easy being brown. This is Job's big idea for racial harmony. All the pressure to be bright. It's this <laughs> puppet that sings this highly offensive song. I got children all over town that was used in uh, an act that Whitey wasn't quite ready for. And... My name is Justin Grant Wade, and I play Steve Holt. Steve Holt! Steve Holt! Steve Holt! He's just a, a fun guy, uh, definitely likes himself. My name is Mae Whitman. I played Anne Paul Veal. Nobody could figure out why George Michael liked her. You know, her, she's sort of plain. And let me just add that I was wearing a fat suit on the show. People always come up to me and they're like, God, you look great. Jeez, you've lost so much weight. You know, we had just fabulous guest stars on this show. My name is Justin Lee, and the character I played is uh, Anyang Bluth. Lucille adopts a son from Korea. Anyang in Korean means uh, hello. 
and the only thing that I ever say for the next few episodes is Anyang. They keep saying Anyang to him, and so he just keeps saying it back to them. And that, that became my name, Anyang. And yeah, my wife and I use it all the time. Let's go. Anyang. 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 My name is David Reynolds. I got to play the uh, character of White Power Bill. I would like to say that he's he's probably like a retarded racist because like the only person he like attacks in the film is, are like white people. White power. <laughs> <laughs> the first big get was Liza Minnelli. I was able to hear that somebody was interested in doing the show and then write it right for them. Julia Louis Dreyfus, Zach Braff, Amy Poehler. We all knew it was pretty special when they got some heavy hitters. Charlize Theron, Ben Stiller, Carl Weathers, Carl Weathers, Carl Weathers. When you have people of that caliber, it just as a writer, it just forces you to, we gotta do better, we gotta do better, we gotta do better. And then there were people we never were able to get in that said they'd be willing to do it. Ricky Gervais said he'd be willing to do it. Sasha Baron Cohen I desperately wanted. We also heard at one point that Christopher Walken was willing to be in the show. I'm Ed Begley and I play Stan Sitwell. He has physical characteristics that are quite unusual. Stan Sitwell couldn't grow his own hair because he had what? Alopecia. So he doesn't want to go on natural, doesn't want to go for the ball look. He's got different eyebrows that he moves around, and well, he doesn't intend to move them around, but they do. It is a disturbing character that he ended up creating. My name is Andy Richter. I remember we had Andy play himself. But the guy on set started to really push me and be like, no, 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 I, I want you to do it as if, like, you know, you're a big fat guy that just wants to eat. And I said, oh, you mean the old fatty loves to eat joke? You want me to be a big fat loser who just wants to fill his fat face? And the guy went, yeah, yeah, that's what I want. And he had just done a show for Fox called Quintuplets. Google it. And I don't know if it was his idea, but there, a writer on the show, Jim Vallely, there was something about me being on the show that he found uh, endlessly amusing. I called up Mitch Hurwitz. He goes, well, we already had him on the show as Andy Richter. I go, but what if the teacher's Andy Richter's twin brother? I do remember one of them's name was Cherith. And then Mitch goes, what if he's Andy, one of Andy Richter's quintuplet brothers? But quintuplets failed, too. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm, you know, showbiz cancer. I like Barry Zuckercorn. Barry Zuckercorn, the complete idiot attorney. He's very good. I just want to say I am in a shirt and tie because Barry was very well dressed. When I heard that, that Henry was going to be on the show, I was in heaven. The best part of playing Barry was his ties. I got to keep some of them. This is not it. But he's clearly the worst lawyer ever. He's so gross and creepy. Has no idea how the judicial system works. His character is so unlike what he's known for. And for him to have been, at one point, the coolest guy in the world as the Fonz. The biggest problem he's got is he has no idea what his sexuality is. Probably next to the Fonz. I think, I bet it's his favorite character. He believes he might have a vagina, but he's actually never said that to anybody. The weirder his guy got, the happier Henry was. Mitch and the writers paid homage to Happy Days for the Fonz twice. You know, the episode where he's in the bathroom, and they're having a conversation in the bathroom, and he turns to the mirror. He's like, hey. And I looked at my hair and went, I don't have to comb it. You're like, that is so brilliant. Then the second is, I am the only actor in the world who has jumped the shark twice. The history of Jump the Shark is there was a scene in Happy Days where Fonzie, played by Henry Winkler, was in a leather jacket on water skis going to jump over a shark, and Ron Howard, Richie Cunningham, was driving the boat. And that's the quintessential point where it's like, come on. Because that's what Jump the Shark is. Jump the Shark is that the producers have sold out. And it gave birth, really, to the phrase. And so you take that metaphor and you apply it to any television show. We did a cross-promotional episode with Burger King, which is just sort of absurd for a show like Arrested Development. When you talk about Arrested Development with respect to jumping the shark, I could talk for hours. Buster gets his hand bitten off by um, a seal. We made it a seal because that rhymed with Lucille's name. They eventually find um, a shark who they think ate the seal. OK, now we got to get Henry Winkler down there. And I jumped over it.
If you didn't know that that's where the term came from, you'd totally be lost in you. And it was like, oh my God, did they really just do that? Oh, wow. Without having to say a word, just the subtle look at the shark, jump over it. But the joke's not done yet because there's no other meaning of jump the shark. It should be in an episode where we jump the shark. So we actually shot a scene in a Burger King. We all got commitment to Burger King because they put our name on their little table tents. And then the punctuation point on it was Henry's line uh, going off to Burger King and jumping the shark. I don't think Arrested Development ever jumped the shark. I don't think it was on long enough. I think they got out whether they wanted to or not. They got out at the right time. So sometimes like that whole thing came together for that joke. I knew that Winkler was the attorney. And you know, it was one of those things I just didn't quite do the math. I am Scott Bayo and I play I am, <laughs> I am Scott Bayo and I played Bob Blah Blah. It was a good choice after having Barry Zuckercorn. I was sort of the um, a younger Fonzie. You know, in retrospect, it seemed natural that I would just take his place. I actually like a guest character solely uh, for his name, and that, of course, be uh, Scott Bayo. Well, uh, first of all, when they sent me the script, and I'm from New York, and my accent got in the way of the name, so I looked at it and said, Bob Loblaw. And I was doing a scene with Bateman, and he said, and here's our attorney, Bob Loblaw. And I went, that's the name? I was so completely thrown out of the scene by, by him saying that. Why would you name a character Bob Loblaw? Blah blah? Simply so you could say, Bob blah blah. Bob blah blah. Bob blah blah. So I think in the end they, they agreed to Bob blah blah. No. Bob blah blah. Yeah. It just became a, just a big joke. And without him, there would be no Bob blah blah's law blog. Bob blah blah law blog. Bob blah blah's law blog. But I knew going in that it would be uh, just nuts. And it was. It almost seems very improv -ed. I don't know how much improv they did on the, act the actual show. We heard that a lot, uh, pretty consistently. And there's no better testament to the writers uh, than the fact that people think that. They didn't need to improvise. They didn't want to improvise. The writing was so good. It was supposed to sound like we were improvising. The show looks spontaneous, but so unbelievably not spontaneous. The words were very good. You don't want to fix something that isn't broken. It was such a, uh, a dense show as well, in terms of just pure volume of scriptage, that you knew that if you improvise too much, most of it wouldn't get in the show anyway. Although, we weren't discouraged. Once we would get a scene done as written, sometimes we would say different stuff, different jokes. The comedy was very specific. The dialogue had to be delivered pretty much on book. A lot of improv took place on the set. We would improv some stuff and Mitch would be like, what do you think? And it just it wasn't as funny as what's in the script. The cameras were connected to Mitch's office. And if he didn't hear what he wanted to hear, if I thought I was being funny <laughs> off the script, he would all of a sudden appear in front of me like a genie. When all of production and, and all the guys are not sitting around hanging out outside in their trucks and they're all on stage, watching the action, you know that there was something going on. But the only time that we would improv would be an ambulance, right? Yeah. Nice. people dying. And when you've got guys like David Cross and Will Arnett and all these guys going for it, you're going to get hilarious stuff. It's something I can't even help. It's almost like a form of Tourette's, where you just can't shut up and let well enough be. I wonder what kind of show you could put together with all the cut footage. Find that. Find that footage. You know how you do that? Follow the money. Follow the money. <laughs> One of my favorite moments was Michael Sarah walking the red carpet. All you can hear is Michael Sarah, Michael Sarah, Michael Sarah. And, like, and he's thinking, like, what the f? And then he realizes that he's right in between Michael Douglas and Sarah Jessica Parker. And so the photographers are yelling, Michael Sarah. Is that for real? Yeah, it's a true story. Wow. No, I lied. They won the best comedy first year out of the box, and I was elated because I thought, you know, that's it. 
and it was really like out of nowhere. And I, they were clearly all surprised. Wasn't that incredible, that Emmy? When the show won the Emmys, it was gratifying and sort of uh, encouraging and, and affirming. That was an awesome night. That was an awesome night. It was like the craziest sensation, the craziest victory. I don't think we'll ever have an experience like that night. It was such an incredible feeling. And hey, I've won tons of Emmys before, but that Emmy, no, I haven't. I remember Ellen DeGeneres saying it, and the words came out, and I remember jumping up. It was a great moment for Mitch. It was a great moment for the, for the writing staff. It was a great validation. Mitch Hurwitz, in those speeches at the Emmys, we found out that Hurwitz is actually one of the best Emmy speech givers in Emmy history. It was probably the best acceptance speech I've ever heard. You know, it kind of as funny as anything that you ever see on the show. He was like, all right, great, now watch it. He was kind of brilliant, wasn't he? I get myself in trouble here. Hmm. The night we won the Emmy, I saw Gail Berman, and she was then president of Fox Entertainment, and she showed me an email that on her BlackBerry that she had gotten from Peter Chernin, her boss. She had texted him, arrest and development just won. And what he wrote back was, oh, shit. As sort of the, the way that the awards and nominations kind of went out in the schedule, it would often coincide with the schedule of, of, of having to give producers notice of whether they need to write more scripts. And she said, can you believe it? I said, Gail, that's not, holy shit. Oh, sure it is. No, he's, he's blown away. I said, no, that's oh shit. Are you more apt to watch a comedy if it won an Emmy for a best comedy? No, I don't think so. I don't really care about like awards and stuff like that. It's not like, oh, well, that won the Emmy, so I need to watch it. Those Emmys were like, oh, are we finally transitioning into some sort of popular acceptance? And unfortunately, it never materialized after that point. All of America was supposed to say, man, that show won an Emmy. I've got to check it out. <laughs> I think it gave us more credibility, and it kept it on but I don't really know if it actually honestly improved the ratings. We sort of thought, what show is that that, that, that won? And then we're not really gonna really spike audience-wise from it. Turned out to be true. I think they, that each time it got nominated and won, it was just like a little sphincter pinch for everybody at Fox, like, damn it. There's another eight shows we have to do. It's really what kept us on the air. Jim actually told me a funny story about it, that after the Emmys, that next show there was an anticipation of a ratings bump so that gave us a little injection of hope and optimism uh before that came crashing down of course the day after we pulled up to fox you know when you drive into the fox lot there's massive billboards they have those huge crazy big big billboards and there was like a huge billboard in the front for like jamie kennedy's new movie and then we like drive around the corner and there was a tiny little banner on the inside of the studio the kind of thing you get that's like we're raising money for the firehouse come to our barbecue chicken night that said congratulations arrested for five emmys that banner was up for a few days and then the morning after that much anticipated airing of the next show, that banner changed to something like really depressing, like that, you know, show where they blew up cars and showed a lot of tees. <laughs> it was like that thing, like coming up, you know, exploding tees. Check it out this fall on Fox. Well, and that show did seem to be written the day before it was shot. Our scripts were notoriously late. Yeah, the script definitely did come in late. And we used to get the scripts on Wednesday or sometimes even Thursday morning. Mitch is notorious for not having scripts. He could be a little infuriating because he'd be rewriting to the last second. I think Mitch was a bit of the kid who would write his report the night before it was due. I really did feel like I wanted more time with it. On Arrested, it reached the point of absurdity. It was probably not terribly disciplined in terms of when you got the scripts. And the scripts came in late because I was putting my creative expression ahead of the studio's creative expression. I mean, he always came through, and he came through with A-level material, obviously, but it was, in it was incredible. You know, instead of seeking the counsel of, of the studio and the network, I kind of took my own counsel and said, let's, let's just keep going and try to make this better.
the poor directors really had nothing to prep with. By Mitch in the gang kind of getting these scripts and always sort of right at the nick of time, it just created this extra bit of energy. If something wasn't working, um, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, I, I, you know, I couldn't eat. I, it just bothered me. And that created the style of it. It, it. To me, when I see it now, it's clearly the work of um, a maniac. I think it was probably more difficult for the production, because they had to pull things together really quickly. And the writers would write, 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 up until the very last minute that they had to turn the script over to us. That wonderful crew. They had very little prep time. I, I don't know what went on in Mitch's head most of the time. It was a mystery. Everyone on the crew had to be fairly creative, because you had to do stuff you know, without it really being on the page often. Remember once at a Christmas party, we called up John Amadeo, our producer, and asked him if he could get us the Queen Mary. <laughs> when? For Monday. It's like Saturday night, in the middle of Christmas season. Can you get us the Queen Mary? He calls us up Sunday. Hey, I got the Queen Mary. <laughs> well, I love Midge, and we have a great relationship, but I think it's fair to use the word insanity. The double-edged sword of being Midge is that he had the fun of working with the staff and the cast, but, you know, he also had this real heavy lifting to do, which is supervise the editing. The editing room was just another phase of the writing stage. He didn't edit in a timely manner. He didn't do anything in a timely manner. You know, and I know Mitch would go into the editing room and... When he would edit, would basically rewrite the show and... Try to make things, you know, funnier, not, not go the other direction because you're losing jokes, but instead, how do you scrunch it? He could come up with new lines, and I know he would actually sit at the edit bay with a microphone and temp in lines. So you would see shots of people's shoulders or backs. If you watch it, there's dialogue on people's backs. He put different words in. So in effect, he was rewriting beyond the last possible moment. So he didn't get it done to start with, he did it on set, and then he did it after. I do love that they were able to insert some political aspects into the show. We did get a note early on from the network because we had all this stuff about the Iraq war. The whole Iraq war thing was uh, really genius. The concern was, you know, won't the Iraq war be over by the time this airs? Aren't you a little worried it'll be outdated? It's like, no, no, no. Our grandkids will be part of that. Bush, if he did give this country one thing, it really was a, a deep sense of shame and, and, and irony that was not lost on our, um, on our writing staff. It was, it, was, it was generous of him. They got away with murder. Yeah. You don't see a lot of people throwing themselves under buses, you know? The subject matter was kind of risque with the war and Bush and, I mean, it, it wasn't that subtle. One of my favorite lines is when the uh, newscaster comes on and goes, WMDs found in Iraq, what this means for your weekend tonight at 10. When they're driving through Iraq, they talk about Halliburton Way and, and Cheney Drive. In the background, during one of those scenes, they have the mission accomplished banner. Solid as a rock. One of my favorite subplots was the, you know, Saddam Hussein <laughs> as, as a client. I actually was made up as Saddam, and they buried me, which was hysterically funny. You know, these kind of major issues that are going on at the time, they, they, they magically weave them into the show. But it wasn't the show. It didn't supersede the, the comedy. I kind of hate political satire, but this show approached it in a way that was funny and topical, but wasn't bashing you in the head stupid about it. These guys had balls. When you see the copyright dates of some of these episodes and the things that they were suggesting. This is 2003, 2004, we've just invaded Iraq, and someone had the balls to go in and, and to poke fun at it. And put it on the Fox network of all places, these guys these guys have to go through those doors sideways. You know, those are some balls. You kind of feel like we slipped it past them somehow, you know? It's great to make uh, humor out of something bad, you know? If that, you know, what do you got? It's a money laundering scheme. It's corrupt businesses. It's a fine line to be able to write political satire that works as humor, even if you don't carry the politics into it. A very, very perceptive vision in advance uh, by Mitch that this was a con job. Show. Hey, do. 
They just take things that you should not even broach the subject and turn it into gold. It's a little startling at first. Like if you try and tell someone, you know, you kind of get some weird looks. Like what the hell are you watching, you know? It kind of shows you in microcosm the risks that this show took. He's so cute and innocent, but yet he has this little um, dark secret. He's just, you know, that classic 13, 14, 15 year old guy with some crazy crush, and it just happens to be his cousin. Ultimately, at the heart of the George Michael Maybe relationship were, you know, two kids that were really lonely. It was actually my first kiss ever, that, that kiss with Michael, and I remember one of the execs from Fox was there, and I was like, yeah, I'm really nervous, actually, because I've never kissed anyone. It was not a salacious relationship between the two of them. It was a boy who needed a sister, and then wanted to see his sister naked. Oh. Ah, what the f That's rad. Yeah, yeah, incest is just a riot, especially on network TV. It takes a special touch to do incest, I think, and make it, uh, make it accessible to the masses. I like the fact that he was constantly chasing her. Which could be really offensive to a lot of people, but there's such a fundamental sweetness to it. You didn't think of them in terms of cousins. You didn't care because he was just so in love with her. Their relationship and non-relationship, as the case might be, is probably one of the best conflicts in the entire show. And it's not gross. They don't do anything that's necessarily, you know, wrong, but it's just kind of there. But are they cousins? This is my cousin, maybe. So maybe it's not. A lot of the fans have talked about your rant. Can you speak to that? Um, I don't know exactly what triggered it, but I do remember that we had just gotten, I mean, literally maybe uh, 15 minutes ago, 10 minutes prior to that, we had just gotten uh, yet another piece of bad news. I don't remember what it was. It was, you know, we're gonna go on a break, uh, uh, you know, we're gonna shut down, or one of those things. Jeffrey and I were talking about something, and then I just, you know, you get angry, and you, I wasn't doing it for the camera, but I mean, I stand by it, you know. I kind of knew that we just weren't going to make it at Fox. Fox gets so much bashing, I guess, for however they, you know, promoted or marketed the show. This show was a weird animal. It was always very hard for them to figure out what to do with it. I do think they tried to market it. There was a lot of support for the show, and some people would disagree with me. Fox didn't advertise? That was a big problem. Yeah, I mean, maybe they could have marketed it maybe a little different. They didn't have the backing to aggressively promote the show. There's a lot of power in marketing, and they really can change the outcome of something. I think they, I think they did everything that they knew how to do. I don't want to comment on how well they did it. I know that they f***ing tried hard. They were held responsible for my belief, which was that if you try to make every single part of it funny, an audience will come. And that really was my belief. I felt that they didn't get it. It's difficult for a network to promote to its viewers a show that really doesn't resemble anything that's out there. I don't think they knew what it was or knew who the audience was. And obviously, Fox has had a really hard time breaking any comedy hits other than animation, period. I wasn't trying to do something that was so obscure that people didn't get it. I was trying to create something that people had to make an effort for. They didn't have a lot of great time slots, and the whole Sunday night at 9.30, uh, you know, was a death slot. Their network at the time was The Simpsons and King of the Hill and Family Guy on Sunday night. And this didn't fit into either of those boxes. They had a difficult task. And I think it lasted longer than anybody at Fox really would have wanted it to. You know, I think it was a sore point for them. Mitch told us once that he had actually gone to someone in the network, and I swear to God, they said to him, do you mind dumbing it down just a little bit? Come on. 
Many times people wanted to reshape the show or try to find a single focus as opposed to the several stories that the show has, and he just would always resist it. The only things they could give notes on were the scripts. The note was, can you do 15% less? You know, does it have to be so complicated? There was a time I thought there were too many stories. You know, that it's hard to follow that many stories. Not a bad note, actually. Probably if we had taken it, um, I wouldn't be in this hole. <laughs> They were very respectful, and they were very worried. You know, they, they put a lot of money into this thing, and they probably put over $50 million into making this. What people tend to forget, though, is they did give us two and a half years, and they didn't have to. They didn't feel it was worth the extra step of also spending a lot of money on promotion, and that's just an equation that, you know, studios have to make. We also thought that, the country would catch on. That's what I don't get. For the most part, the heart of the country did not watch the show. And by the heart, I mean the middle, like the Midwest. They're to blame. In every definition of the word missed, uh, America missed it. America Ferreira, the girl who plays Ugly Betty, I don't know if she ever watched it. Huh. Every critic at every newspaper says this is the best sitcom on TV. But for what, some reason, America says, no, oh, I've never heard of it. Unfortunately, a lot of the really good shows that are critically acclaimed, they don't, people don't watch them. The audience has been systematically taught over the generations, you know, just sit there. We'll throw this stuff at you. If it hits you in the forehead, you'll enjoy it. If not, uh, we'll cancel it and throw something else at you. I mean, most people don't even know it existed, really. We sure did our part. We told everybody we knew about it, but I don't know. People just didn't watch it. I'd hear her talking about it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite shows. Nothing. I would call my family, who lives in different parts of the country, and say, did you see my show? And most of them would say, yeah, I didn't like it. I wouldn't watch the show, because I don't watch shows. Uh, and I don't like when I'm filming to watch the show. And Jason would get really mad at me. And he would go, you know, we all, we'd all we all like a little, you know, a little help. I would guess that half the people that saw this show saw this show on a digital video recorder, you know, like a TiVo, or on, um, on DVD. And as soon as you do that, you're off the ratings grid. We also just missed, you know, like the Nielsen rating group started following, you know, college dorms. And that was a big part of our uh, fan base. We would have it on the TV in the background to get ratings, you know, like on every TV in the house. But I don't think we had Nielsen's. It was probably, you know, useless. I think Arrested really believed in its audience, more so than maybe any other show I've ever worked on. In a way, I think it's good that it never had that mass appeal. I know it doesn't help everybody's pocketbook at the end of the day, but it was never going to appeal to, to the entire country. It required some work as a viewer, whereas most shows are like, warm gruel that gets spoon-fed to you while you lay on the couch, calcifying. You kind of lose hope in people. <laughs> you know, we need to be hit over the head with a joke. People need to be reminded, oh, guess what, that's funny, laugh. And the fact that this show did not have a laugh track and didn't telegraph the areas where the audience should laugh, I think hurt it with the vast majority of people. How sad is that? I think America missed this show by six months. Over at NBC, uh, when the when the office came out, they knew that they were you know, even though the, they weren't getting big ratings, uh, they were people were downloading it, people were paying for it. You know, maybe it's a good show to be downloaded. Easy to stop and start, go back and catch that joke again. Because then they would have would have been able to go over to Mino Rupert Murdoch and say, "No, oh, you don't understand, Rupert. It's making money, money." I think that maybe America wasn't ready for this show. The part of America that did miss this show is the same America that watches reality TV. It's better than 95% of the shit that's on now. When the shows like Dancing with the Stars and American Idol are your most popular TV shows, I, don't know, I think there's something wrong with that. Because reality TV is just, it's just awful. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, yeah. There's no writing. Look at all the crap we have on TV. Crap. It's all crap. You just kind of want to tell people, what the fuck is the matter with you? Why are you watching stuff like this? I don't know how else to put it, really. America, what were you thinking? God, you should... 
I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed, America. I'm a great parent to America, by the way. Anyway, go ahead, America, you're fine. I hate to say this, but when I started watching the show, even from the first season, I always kind of thought it was doomed. I was at the um, Vanity Fair after party for the Oscars one year, and um, Rupert Murdoch was there. We really were a ratings fiasco. He was very excited about talking about 24, which is a Fox show. And I said, yeah, 24, that's great. And I'm really, I love Arrested Development. No matter how brilliant a show is, it does not mean that it's gonna stay on the air. And he said, that's a cable show. That sh shouldn't be on the networks. And then I, I just kind of, ah, we're fucked. <laughs> we are fucked now. Basically, a show gets canceled for one reason. It doesn't get ratings. You know, it's not that complicated. First word that comes to your mind when I say arrested. Canceled. I do want to say I was a little surprised that it lasted as long as it did. I never got involved when a TV show was canceled. I could care, you know, hey, they come and they go. But when that show got canceled, it really bothered me deep down. I felt the need to, like, sign petitions, you know, for a TV show. I never did that before in my life. When I finally read the news that they had canceled the show, it was like a punch in the gut. I wanted to cry. We weren't canceled. We were taken into an alley and shot in the back of the head. This show had lymph node cancer, and it was diagnosed with multiple compound fractures, contusions, internal bleeding from the beginning. No one expected the pilot to get picked up. I thought I had the way to make it a hit. I was wrong. No one expected to get the second season. It was just like, when are they going to cancel it? That was all we ever said. When are they going to cancel it? When are they going to cancel it? And no one expected to get the last half. Every time we do a, a, a section of 13 episodes, we really didn't know if we were coming back. We never really felt like a ton of people were watching it. Turned out to be true. We really did a cable show on network television. You know, you just can't have a show on network TV and not get the numbers that make sense for them. It's all about advertising and all these crazy things that have nothing to do with creativity. This sounds so odd. In a way, I was glad we were canceled because I was I was just sick of the fight and sick of the that that hanging on the ledge. Oh, our numbers. I don't know if the ratings ever really changed. We felt like the ratings changed. It has to do with the 18 to 49 audience, which is the you know the audience everybody wants because of advertising, and um, we didn't get the numbers as they say. You know that's what that's what happened. It wasn't that much of a shock. You know, we, we kind of saw it coming. We didn't know week to week whether we were going back to work for a long time. Maybe all along it really needed to be a cable show. You know, who knows? So I don't mean to be sour grapes about it, but the one thing that was slightly amusing in retrospect was they had heavily, heavily promoted their new Pamela Anderson show called Stacked. And I just thought that was hilarious that, like, a show about Pamela Anderson being a, some kind of, like, in, like, a bookstore or something like that. It's like, you know, the Desperate Housewives is a hit, and they have breasts. I would just call it tits, you know? Stacked! Uh, it's the biggest hit that's ever been on TV, stacked! I just couldn't understand it. You know, and then it did less numbers than we did. It was just really disappointing that Fox put the last four episodes in a row, two hours, back to back, right up against the Winter Olympics. And the airing was ridiculous. What a way to end the show. That was kind of, you know, guys, <laughs> what are you doing to us? You know, we don't even have a chance. It's like, you guys don't have anywhere you can put this to get some ratings? It was indicative of, you know, again, how the show was sort of treated. You know, corporate is corporate. There's nothing better to, than to watch, you know, <laughs> your blood and sweat and tears thrown away. I don't know, when, when a network cancels a show, they no longer give a I think at that point, I just, it was like totally for the fans. I kind of thought, well, maybe it'll be easier. You know, maybe I'll just be able to do anything I want. And I realized, no, it's, it's going to be just as hard, and we have to make it all fit. It was frustrating, but having been a network executive, I know, I know the rules of the game. And once they cancel you and they say there's not a future, 
you know, they just throw you out there. I do think they tried. At the Iowa caucuses, my wife Cheryl and my kids all went. At this point, uh, Cheryl and I were working on behalf of Hillary Clinton. And there were these, these two guys, these young guys. I eventually went over to sidled up to these guys. All they wanted to talk about was arrested development. And I turned and I started to go. And uh, the tall guy said, Ron, I'll make a deal with you. If, if we're asked to, to choose another candidate, We'll go with Hillary, but you have to promise me you make the Arrested Development movie. No matter where I go in the world, the question is... Is there going to be a film? Is there going to be a film? Hey, when's the movie coming? Movie. Movie. Movie, movie, movie. I think it, it would really uh, lend itself to, to the big screen. Just as a fan, I pray that the rumors are true. I think it'd be the best thing in the world. I think everybody wants to see that team back together again and then really to pick up where they left off. The principal element to it is an opportunity for all of us to enjoy them again. I don't know what the status of the movie is, to be honest. Wait, say that without the glass. I don't know what the status of the movie is. I, um... I'm not entirely sure what the status of the movie is. I think the movie is going to happen. You know, I know Mitch has been talking about it. We, are, we have been talking about doing this movie. That's why he ended that last episode saying, you know, maybe a movie. I know that Jason's been talking about it in the press a lot. We've all really been very honest with the media. I mean, almost to a fault. Mitch is supposedly writing it. The script could be written. It may not be written. It may never get written. We'll see how much they zoom and, and make the audience seasick on the big screen. The movie has been rumored ever since the show first got canceled. We were talking about the movie as early as the first season. I remember talking to Mitch about it. I think about doing the movie. I have some plot ideas. I think they had a lot more to say and a lot more to do. I read stuff on the internet that people are like, enough already with the movie rumors. You know, it's like, guys, either do it or don't. Do you think I should do it? And then Mitch started making phone calls around to us, finding out who would be on board and who wouldn't. He was just pretty much like, so if we do make it, would you be a part of it? And I was like, all right, sure. I mean, the fact is, I think we would all love to do it. They all want to. I certainly would, would welcome it. I love it. I've talked to Bateman. I've talked to Will. Everybody wants to do it. It seems like a pretty simple question for me. I mean, even when we were being canceled, he took advantage of the cancellation and wrote it in. So I know he'll write whatever is going on, whatever stories are going on, who's on board, who's not on board, whatever, it's all gonna be in there. It's very possible. Whether or not they call me, I don't know if there's gonna be room for all the many characters who came to visit. Maybe I'll come back as a twin brother. You wanna know, you know, where the f is maybe gonna be in five years, and what happens to Buster? Maybe his hand becomes bionic. There's got to be an arrested movie. You know, come on. There's obviously been a lot of talk about it. You know, and I hope that happens. I wouldn't bet on that one either. For some reason, arrested development and money have never been friends. <laughs> maybe because the show ultimately makes fun of people who had money. Or maybe we actually did try to say something. Maybe we changed the world just a little bit. You know, the, the other side of that is that you have Ron Howard who can get movies done. Look, it, it, it's happening, by all accounts. I was in the bathroom at the DGA, and I look up, and it, Ron Howard is in, is in the urinal. There are a lot of rumors flying around. And I'm not the kind of guy who approaches guys at a urinal. I'd by God be the narrator. You can't give anybody else that microphone. He was a big fan of the show, so I mean, maybe. And we're now no longer talking about who's in, who's out. What's it going to be? When's it coming out? He says they have the money to make that movie. <laughs> so I can't. I can't you can ask anything you want. <laughs> ask away. I think everyone needs closure, although I don't know how he's going to wrap this thing up. Yeah. Or at the very least, a Christmas special where they sing songs. So, your thoughts on the show coming back? Kind of like Family Guy. Not happening. What's not happening? Show's not coming back. It's gotten a lot bigger. On DVD, a lot more fans. Nothing like family. It's, you know.
Would you watch it? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah I'd what? definitely watch it. <laughs> so you would watch it today? Yes, sure. I'd probably give it a shot. Yeah, I'd probably watch it. Yes, I would. Yes, I would. Oh, yeah, of course. Tomorrow, the next day, and the next day on. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. 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 I'd probably be interested in it. I would. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. The next day. Exactly. Historically, it will be viewed as one of the most important shows in television. If more shows like Arrested Development were on television, then TV would be good and not just a guilty pleasure. It really was lightning in a bottle. This combination of a brilliant cast, a really original idea, and such a rare convergence. It's a goddamn shame. I feel bad for anybody who's a big fan of TV who hasn't seen Arrested Development. Arrested Development was the show that could have changed the face of American television. It just never got the chance. And uh, I think it will be viewed as such in the annals of television history. I hate the words groundbreaking, but really, I mean, come on. It was groundbreaking. I'm really proud to say I had any involvement in Arrested Development. It was pretty damn funny, if I do say so. I think Peter Chernin once called it to us, uh, you know, a noble experiment. Or, you know, even he said, we're proud of the show. It was worth it. Was worth it. You know, it was just a goddamn pleasure. Describe the show in one word. Oh. <sighs> Threw a curveball there. Smart. Insane. Hilarious. Brilliant. Visionary. Perfect. Complex. The song Tennessee. I mean, I wish it wasn't so, but they were first. Family. Rest in peace. Good evening. The end. I love the fans of Arrest Development. There really is something about the kind of people who love the show. The Aztec Tomb, I saw this on eBay, and this is sort of the first big purchase I made. As you can see, the revolving door does work. It's a tight squeeze. I've never met a person who said, hey, I love that show. I didn't like, and it's not an ego thing, because I have met people who uh, have liked Golden Girls who I just want to punch in the face. I have this water bottle from ARMY, infamous girls with high self-esteem. And then I have kitty sunglasses up here, Michael. This one old lady couldn't shut up about it the other day. I said, God, you smell like death. The corn baller is a culinary wonder machine. It's something like a deep fryer, and uh, it's very dangerous. So I would always enjoy these conversations that I would have with the fans because, you know, they got it. They got it. But arrested fans rarely smell like death.